Chapter Fourteen of Unto Caesar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Unto Caesar by Baroness Orksey chapter fourteen hast thou an arm like god or canst thou thunder with a voice like him job eleven verse nine a few moments later licinia came running back into the room augusta she exclaimed excitedly even before she had crossed the threshold augusta quick the caesar dea flavia started for she had indeed been suddenly awakened from a dream slowly and with eyes still vague and thoughtful she turned to her slave the caesar she repeated whilst a puzzled frown appeared between her brows and the young blood faded from her cheeks the caesar ay said the old lady hurriedly he is in the atrium even now having just arrived and his slaves fill the vestibule he desires speech with thee he does not often come at this hour said dea flavia whose face had become very white and set at mention of a name which indeed had the power of rousing terror in every heart just now does he seem angered she asked under her breath no no said licinia reassuringly how could he be angered against thee my pet lamb but come quickly dear to the robing room what dress wilt thou put on to greet the caesar in nay nay she said with a tremulous little laugh we'll not keep my kinsman waiting that indeed might anger him he has been in this room before and hath liked to watch me at my work let him come now as he wills licinia would have protested for she loved to deck her darling out in all finery that to her mind rendered the augusta more beautiful than a goddess but there was no time to say anything for even now the caesar's voice was heard at the further end of the atrium do not disturb your mistress i'll talk to her myself nay i'll not be announced tis an informal cousinly visit i'm paying her this morning he seemeth in good humour whispered dea flavia whose little hands were trembling as they made pretence once more of taking up the modelling tools licinia hurriedly tried to smooth down the golden hair which had become unruly during the course of the morning but in her haste only succeeded in completely disarranging it and it fell in wavy masses down the young girl's shoulders all but one plait which remained fixed over her brow like a wide band of gold dea uttered an exclamation of horror and made a quick gesture trying to capture the recalcitrant curls even at the very moment that the emperor caligula entered the room he paused on the threshold and her arms dropped down to her side her golden hair fell all around her as she bent her knees making an obsolescence to the caesar there was nothing regal about her now nothing impervious or proud she looked just like a child caught unawares at play blushing with confusion she advanced towards her kinsman and with head bent received his kiss upon her pure forehead nor did she shrink at this loathsome contact which would have filled almost any other woman's heart with horror to her this man was not really human he was the caesar a supernatural being blessed by the gods and endowed by them with supreme majesty and power dismiss thy slaves he said curtly i would have speech with thee he had well schooled his turbulent temper to calmness after chaos napo's departure and a final outburst of unbridled violence he had plunged into a cold bath and given himself over for half an hour to the ministration of his slaves 
then cool and refreshed at any rate outwardly he had dressed himself in simple robes and passing right through the halls of the palace of tiberius which adjoined his own he had reached the precincts of dea flavia's house which in turn abutted on that built by germanicus at any other time but the present one when his frenzied mind was wholly given over to the thoughts of the terrible treachery against his own person he would have been conscious of dea flavia's exquisite beauty as she stood before him humbled with the proud humility of one who has everything to give and nothing to receive chaste with that pure ignorance which refuses to know what it cannot condone and withal a perfect woman imbued with a fascination which no man has ever been able to resist for it was the fascination of youthful loveliness combined with the stately aloofness of conscious power at any other time but this the unscrupulous voluptuary would have gazed on his beautiful kinswoman with eyes that would have shamed her with her undisguised admiration and mayhap his look and actions would have placed a severe test on her loyalty and on her respect for him but to-day caligula only saw in her the tool whom conspirators meant to use for their treacherous ends her loveliness paled in his eyes before the awful suspicion which he had of her guilt and whilst she stood quietly awaiting his pleasure he marvelled how much she knew of the traitor's plans and whether her white fingers would effectually thrust the dagger into an assassin's hand she had dismissed her slaves at his bidding all unconscious as she was of any danger that might threaten her through him he waited for a while in silence then he said abruptly dea flavia what is thine age she looked up at him smiling and puzzled some twenty years great caesar she replied but of a truth i had not kept count twenty years he retorted then tis high time that i chose a husband for thee this time she looked up at him boldly and although in her glance there was all the respect due to the immortal caesar yet was there no show of humility in her attitude as she threw back the heavy masses of her hair and drew up her slender figure to its full stately height was it to tell me this she asked simply that the greatest of caesars sought his servant's house to-day in part he rejoined curtly and i would hear thine answer my lord has not deigned to ask a question art prepared to accept a husband whom i thine emperor will choose for thee in all things i do give thee honour and reverence o caesar she replied but but what but i had no thought of marriage no thought of marriage he retorted roughly as unable to sit still harassed by rage and doubt he once more started on that restless walk of his up and down the room she watched him with great wondering eyes that something serious lay behind his questionings was of course obvious he had not paid her this matutinal visit for the sole purpose of passing the time of day and she did not like this strange mood of his nor his reference to a topic over which he had not worried her hitherto in truth the thought of marriage had never entered her head even though Lucinia, with constant garrulousness had oft made covert allusions to that coming time she knew for it had been instilled in her from every side ever since her father had left her under the tutelage of the caesar that she must eventually obey him if one day he desired that she should marry the young patrician girl would never dream of rebellion against the power of a father or a guardian and when that guardian was the caesar himself and the girl was of the imperial house the very thought of disobedience savoured of sacrilege 
but hitherto that question had loomed ahead in dea flavia's dreams of the future only as a very shadowy and vague she had never given a single thought to any of the young men who paid her homage and her, their efforts at winning her favours had only caused her to smile she had felt herself to be unconquerable even unattainable and caligula before this mad frenzy had fully seized hold of him had in his own brutish way indulged her in this allowing her to lead her own life and secretly laughing at the machinations that went on around him to obtain the most coveted matrimonial prize in rome now suddenly this happy state of things was to come to an end her freedom on which she looked at her most precious possession was to be taken roughly from her one of the men whom she had despised one of that set of libertines of idle voluntaries who had dangled round her skirts while casting covetous eyes upon her fortune was to become her master her supreme lord and she a slave to his desires and to his passions strangely enough the thought of it just now was particularly horrible to her the thought of what the caesar's wish might mean the inevitableness of it all nauseated her until she felt sick and faint and the walls of the room began to swing round her so that she had to steady herself on her feet with a mighty effort of will lest she should fall she knew the caesar well enough to realize that if he had absolutely set his mind on her marriage nothing would make him swerve from the thought if he once desired a thing he would never rest night or day until his wish had been fulfilled men and women of rome knew that patricians and plebes senators and slaves had died horrible deaths because the caesar had demanded and they had merely thought to disobey therefore it was with wide-open terror-filled eyes that she watched that tyrannical master in his restless walk up and down the room outside greater darkness had gathered heavy clouds obscured the light and the gorgeous figure of the caesar now and then vanished into the dark angles of the room reappearing a moment later like some threatening ghoul that comes and goes blown by the wind which foretells the coming storm after a while caligula paused in his walk and stood close beside her looking as straight as he could into her pale face no thought of marriage he repeated with one of his mirthless laughs no thought mayhap of the husband whom i would choose for thee no doubt there is even now lurking somewhere in this palace a young gallant who alone has the right to aspire to dea flavia's grace my lord is pleased to jest she said coolly and knows as well as i do that no patrician can boast of a single favour obtained from me then tis on a slave thou hast chosen to smile he said roughly then as she did not deign to make reply to his insult he continued come art mute thou dost not speak when caesar commands what does my lord wish me to say hast a lover girl no my lord thou liest did i deceive my lord in this then had i not the courage to look boldly in the caesar's face bah he said with a snarl i mistrust that maidenly reserve which men called pride and i clever coquetry the women of rome have realized fortunately by now that they are the slaves of their masters to be bought and sold as he directs the wife must learn that she is the slave of her husband the daughter that she belongs to the father the woman of the house of caesar that they belong to me it is a hard lesson my lord would teach to one half of his subjects it is he said with brutal cynicism but i like teaching it i hope to live long enough nay i mean to live long enough to establish a marriage market in rome where the lords of the earth can buy what women they want openly for so many sesterces 
as they ken their cattle and their pigs she recoiled from the man a little at these words and a blush of shame slowly rose to her cheek but she retorted calmly the gods do speak through caesar's mouth and he frames the laws even as they wish her words flattered his egregious vanity which had even as great if not a greater hold upon him than his tyrannical temper he knew that to this proud girl he was as a god and that her respect for his caesarship made her blind to every one of his faults but this additional simple testimony from her pure lips caused him to relent towards her and quite instinctively made him curb the violent grossness of his tongue thou speakest truly o dea flavia he said complacently the gods will when the time comes speak through my mouth and make known their will through my dictates even as they have done hitherto even as they do at this moment when i tell thee that i desire to see thee married my lord hath spoken she said calmly do not think o dea flavia he continued carried away by his own eloquence that i desire aught but thy happiness if i decide to give thee for wife to a man it shall only be to one who is worthy of thee in every respect thou shalt help me to choose him for i have not yet made my choice he shall testify before thee as to his nobility and his bravery and thou dost assure me that thou hast not yet bestowed thy regard on any man he paused midway in his phrase with indrawn breath waiting for her reply she gave it firmly and without hesitation i have cast my eyes on no man my lord and have no desire to marry wouldst concentrate thy virginity to vesta then he asked with a sneer rather that she replied if my lord would so deign to command tush he broke in impatiently herein thou dost offend the gods and me tis impious to waste thy beauty in barren singleness the gods hate the solitary maid unless she be ill-favoured and unpleasant to every man thou of the house of caesar hath a mission to fulfil and canst not fulfil it thus in isolation fashioning clay figures that have no life which they can consecrate to caesar but have no fear for i thy lord do watch over thy future the man whom i will choose for thee will be worthy of thy smiles he drew up his misshapen figure to its full height and beamed at the young girl with an expression of paternal benignness he was delighted with himself delighted with his own oratory he was such a born montablanc that he could even act the part of kindness and benevolence and he acted it at this moment so realistically that the ignorant confiding girl was taken in by his tricks she saw the gracious smile and was too inexperienced too devoted to see the hideous leer that he was at pains to conceal the choice will be difficult gracious lord she said feeling somewhat reassured and will take some time to make therefore i will trust to inspiration he rejoined blandly the gods no doubt will speak when the time comes ay they will thunder forth their decree at midday to-morrow said caligula with well-assumed majesty to-morrow o oh my lord thou hast said it i have a fancy to make known my decree in this matter during the games at the circus to-morrow so put on thy richest gown o dea flavia augusta he added with a sneer so as to appear pleasing in thy future husband's sight my gracious lord is pleased to jest she said all her fears returning to her in a moment with an overwhelming rush that made her sick with horror jest he retorted with a snarl showing his yellow teeth like a hyena on the prowl nay i never was so earnest in my life 
is not the future of my beloved ward of supreme importance to me nay then good my lord she pleaded earnestly her young voice trembling her blue eyes fixed appealingly on the callous wretch i do beg of thy mightiness to give me time to think to i have done all the thinking he broke in roughly thou hast but to obey indeed indeed she entreated i have no wish to disobey but my gracious lord do i pray thee deign to consider silence wench he shouted with a violent oath for what he deemed her resistance was exasperating his fury and reawakened all his former suspicions of her guilt cease thy senseless whining i thine emperor have spoken let that suffice who art thou that i should parley with thee to-morrow thou go to the circus dost hear and until then remain on thy knees praying to the gods to pardon thy rebellion against caesar and with an air which he strove to render majestic he turned on his heel and prepared to go but in a moment she was down on her knees her hands clutching his robe she would not let him go not now not yet while she had not exhausted every prayer every argument that would soften his heart towards her my gracious lord she pleaded whilst her trembling voice was almost choked with sobs for pity's sake do hear me i am not rebellious not disobedient to thy will i am only a humble maid who holds all her happiness from thee my gracious lord thou art great and thou art mighty thou art kind and just have mercy on me for my whole heart is brimming over with loyalty for thee i am free and i am happy in my freedom the men who fawn around me coveting my fortune fill me with disgust i could not honour one of them my lord i could not give one of them my love thou who art so great must know how i feel i implore thee to leave me my freedom the most precious boon which i possess and my lips will sing a paean of praise to thee for as long as i live but caligula was not the man whom a woman's entreaties would turn from his purpose more especially when that purpose was his own self-interest this wretch who had no heart within him no sensibility not one single feeling of pity or of loyalty his instinct must have told him that dea flavia was loyal to the core loyal to caesar and to his house but so blinded was he by rage and humiliation by the terror of assassination that he saw in the earnest simple pleadings of a young girl and devoted partisan nothing but the obstinate resistance of a would-be traitor the more did dea plea the more did he become convinced that already her choice of a husband was made and that the husband was destined to wrench the sceptre of caesar from him and to mount caesar's throne over his murdered body with a brutal gesture he pushed the young girl from him silence he shouted as soon as choking rage enabled him to speak silence i say ere i strike thee into eternal dumbness what i have said i said dost hear me to-morrow at the circus i will name thy husband and then and there thou shalt accept him whoever he may be i have reason for wishing this a reason of state far beyond the comprehension of a mere fool to-morrow thou shalt accept the man of my choice as thy future lord this is my will look to it o daughter of caesar that thou dost obey caesar has spoken caesar has spoken she pleaded but my gracious lord will relent dost know me girl he retorted as bending down to her he seized her wrists in his and brought his flushed face all distorted by fury close to her own dost know me for if thou hast ever seen me relent once i have set my will look into my eyes now look i say he shouted hoarsely giving her wrists and arms a brutal wrench 
do they look as if they're meant to relent is there anything in my face to lead thee to hope that thou wouldst have thy treacherous way with me he held her wrist so cruelly that she could have screamed with the pain but she bit her lip to still the cry daylight now was yielding to the oncoming storm dense shadows hung all round the room making the objects in it seem weird and ghost-like in the gloom sudden gusts of wind swept angrily around causing the withered leaves and dying flowers in the vases to murmur with unearthly sounds as of the sighing of disembodied souls only through the aperture above a streak of grayish light struck full upon the caesar as with glowing eyes and cruel grasp he compelled her to look on him for a moment she closed her eyes after she had looked for never before had she seen anything so hideous and so evil his misshapen head looked unnaturally large as it seemed to loom out at her from out of the gathering darkness his hair stood up sparse and harsh all round his forehead his eyes were protruding and shot through with blood his lips were dry and cracked his cheeks of a full crimson and heavy sweat was pouring down his face when she turned away from him in horror he broke into that wild laugh of his which had in it the very sounds of hell well he said with a leer hast seen my face art still prepared to disobey no my lord she said slowly and fixing her eyes fully upon his now but i am prepared to die to die what senseless talk is this not senseless my good lord even the gods do allow us poor mortals to find refuge from sorrow in death so he said slowly still gripping her wrists and peering into her face till his scorching breath made her feel sick and faint that is the way thou wouldst defy the will of caesar death sayest thou death and disobedience rather than submission to the wish of him who has godlike power on earth death and he laughed loudly even whilst from afar there came faint and threatening the near presage of a coming storm what death a pleasing dreamless sleep brought on by drugs a soothing draught that lulls even as it kills or hast perchance thought of the arena of tigers that roar or the lecter's flail that drives hast thought hast thought he was foaming at the mouth his rage was choking him he had only just enough strength left in him to tear at the neck of his tunic for the next moment he would have fallen fell like an ox by the power of his own fury but as soon as he had released dea flavia's wrists and she felt herself free to move she rose from her knees and with a quick almost mechanical gesture she rearranged her disordered robe and shook back the heavy masses of her hair then she stood quite still with arms hanging by her side her head quite erect and her eyes fixed upon that raving monster when she saw that he had at last regained some semblance of reason she said quite calmly my gracious lord will work his way with his slave and deal her what death he desires what he murmured incoherently what didst thou say tis death i choose my lord she said simply rather than a husband who was not of mine own seeking for a moment then she did look death straight and calmly in the face for it was death that looked on her through those bloodshot eyes he had thrust his lower jaw forward his teeth large and yellow looked like the fangs of a wolf stertorous breathing escaped his nostrils and his distorted fingers were working convulsively like the claws of a beast when it sees its prey caligula would have strangled her then and there without compunction and without remorse she had defied him and thwarted him even more completely than she knew herself 
and there was no death so cruel that he would not gladly have inflicted upon her then dost dare to defy me he murmured hoarsely hast heard what i threatened she put out her hand quietly interrupting him i heard the threat my lord and have no fear she said no fear of death none gracious lord there is no yoke so heavy as a bond unhallowed no death so cruel as the breaking of a heart there was dead silence in the room now only from afar distant rolls of ceaseless thunder sent their angry echo through the oppressive air caligula was staring at the girl as he would on some unearthly shape gasping he had fallen back a few steps the convulsive twitching of his fingers ceased his mouth closed with a snap and a great yellow patches appeared upon his purple cheeks then he slowly passed his hand across his streaming forehead his breathing became slower and more quiet the heavy lids fell upon the protruding eyes cassius julius caesar caligula was no fool his perceptions in fact became remarkably acute where his own interests were at stake and he had the power of curbing that demonical temper of his even in its maddest moment if self-advantage suddenly demanded it he had formed a plan in his head for the trapping of the unknown man who was to mount the throne of caesar over the murdered body of his emperor before dealing with the whole band of traitors he wished to know who it was that meant to reap the greatest benefit by the dastardly conspiracy there was one man alive in rome at the present moment who thought to become the successor of caligula the one man would be bold enough to woo and win dea flavia for wife caligula's one coherent thought ever since caius nepos had betrayed the conspiracy to him was the desire to know who that man was likely to be that was the man he most hated the unknown man him he desired to punish in a manner that would make all the others endure agonies of horror ere they in turn met their doom but his identity was still a mystery to discover it the caesar had need of the help of this girl who stood there so calmly before him defying his power and his threats he looked on her and understanding slowly came to him understanding of the woman with whom he had to deal it dawned upon him in the midst of his tumultuous frenzy that here he had encountered a will that he could never bend to his own an irresistible force had come in contact with an unbending one one of the two must yield and caligula staring at the young girl who seemed so fragile that a touch of the hand must break her knew that it was not she who would ever give in his well-matured plan he would not give up he had thought it all out whilst he refreshed himself in his bath after caius nepos's visit and it was not likely that any woman could by her obstinate action move caligula from his resolve but obviously he must alter his tactics if he desired dea flavia's help he could gain nothing by her death save momentary satisfaction and the matter was too important to allow momentary satisfaction to interfere with the delights of future complete revenge therefore he forced himself to some semblance of calm he was a perfect mountebank a consummate actor and now he called to his aid his full powers of deception cunning should win the day since rage and coercion had failed slowly his face lost every vestige of anger and sorrowful serenity crept into his eyes toddling like one who feels unmanned he sought the support of a chair and fell sitting into it with his elbows on his knees and his head buried in his hands woe to is me he moaned woe to the house of caesar 
when his fairest daughter turns traitor against her kin i a traitor good my lord she rejoined quietly there is no treachery in my desire to serve caesar in single maidenhood or to offer thee my life rather than my freedom there is black treachery he said with tremulous voice like one in deep sorrow in refusing to obey the caesar in this alone but it was his turn now to interrupt her with a quick raising of the hand ay that is what the waverer says good my lord i'll obey in all save in what doth not please me dea flavia augusta i had thought thee above such monstrous selfishness selfishness my lord ay art thou not of the house of caesar art thou not my kinswoman dost thou not receive at my hands honour position everything that places thee above the common herd of humanity were i not the caesar where wouldst thou be not in this palace surely not the virtual queen of rome but mayhap a handmaid to another caesar's wife an attendant on his daughter thou dost seem to have forgot all this augusta nay gracious lord i have forgot nothing your goodness to me and yet wouldst deliver me over into the hands of mine enemies he said with increased dolefulness and not raise a finger to save me i would give my life for the caesar she interposed firmly and this the caesar knows wouldst not even take a husband when by doing so thou wouldst save the caesar from death my gracious lord speaks in riddles i do not understand didst not understand girl but i wish to test thy loyalty to me thou like so many alas dost so oft prate of unbound attachment to caesar to-day for the first time did i put that attachment to the test and lo it hath failed me try me my lord she said and i will not fail thee but give me thy trust as well as thy commands she advanced close to where he sat apparently a broken-down sorrowful man stricken with grief the mighty caesar now was far more powerful than he had been a while ago when he raged and stormed and threatened for he had appealed to the strongest feeling within her he had appealed to her loyalty slowly she sank once more on her knees not in entreaty now not with thoughts of self but in the humble subjection of herself to the needs of him whom the gods had anointed she sank upon her knees and with that simple action she offered her happiness on the altar of her loyalty to him and to her house gone was the look of defiance from her eyes the pride had vanished in all the joy of life no thought was left in the young mind now save an overwhelming sense of loyalty no feeling lingered in the heart save the desire for self-sacrifice the caesar had commanded and since she could not disobey she was ready to die memory had in a swift flash called up before her the vision of a man who rather than yield to her caprice had smiled at the thought of death and she too had almost smiled for suddenly she had understood how small a thing was life when slavery became its price but now all that had changed the caesar pleaded and made appeal to her loyalty her refusal to obey him was no longer pride it was disloyalty almost sacrilege the caesar called to her it was as if the gods had spoken and she fell on her knees ready to obey the consummate actor was clever enough to hide the triumph that lit up his eyes when he saw her thus kneeling and understood she was prepared to yield he stretched out a paternal hand and with weary sadness stroke her golden hair trust me gracious lord she reiterated my life is thine do with it what thou wilt 
traitors are at work dea flavia to murder the caesar he said gently ye gods she murmured horrified i would think mayhap that the gods will interfere they will i'll tell thee that they will but they have need of thee augusta i thy caesar thy god do have need of thee with both hands now he took her own in his not roughly but with infinite tenderness and cunningly contrived with two hot tears should fall upon her fingers my gracious lord she whispered my life is at thy service accept the husband whom i propose for thee and my life will be safe refuse to obey me in this and to-morrow the blood of caesar will be upon thy head my lord wilt obey me augusta my gracious lord i do not understand she pleaded have pity on my ignorance trust me about a little further i cannot tell thee more he said with a sigh of patient weariness but this i do tell thee that my life and with it the future of our house of the empire now lie in thy hands the abominable traitors would make a tool even of thee the husband of dea flavia augusta they say shall succeed the murdered caesar she uttered a cry of horror their names she murmured tell me their names i know but a few which are they they speak of hortensius martinus oh and young escanis also of falerio my servant ye gods she exclaimed let your judgment fall upon them and of taurus antonor the praefect of rome added the caesar and a savage snarl escaped his lips even when he spoke the name taurus antonor she exclaimed then half audibly she murmured to herself repeating the caesar's words they would make a tool of thee she had fallen back squatting on her heels her hands clasped before her and her head sunk upon her bosom bowed with shame and with horror her name had been bandied about by traitors her person had been bought and sold as the price of the blackest sacrilege that had ever disgraced the patriciate of rome and thou taurus antonor she whispered inaudibly art the blackest traitor amongst them all there was no need now for the caesar to make further appeal to her loyalty she was loyal to him body and soul loyal to him and to her house ready to sacrifice her pride her freedom if need be at the word from the caesar since he had said that by her action on the morrow she could help him fight the treacherous infamy caligula could well be satisfied with his success nor did he try to press his advantage further all that he had wanted was the assurance that she would not thwart him when he put into execution the plan which he had conceived the man-trap which he had set would not now fail through dea's obstinacy he thought that the time had come for ending the interview he desired that her receptive mind should retain a solemn impression of his majesty and of his power a charlatan to the last he now rose to his feet and with outstretched arms pointed upwards to the small glimpse of leaden covered sky jove's thunder still speaks from afar he said with slow emphasis but to-morrow they will crash over rome and over the traitors within her walls the air will be filled with moanings and the gnashing of teeth the tiber will run red with blood for the murdered caesar will mayhap be crying vengeance upon the assassins wilt save the caesar o dea flavia wilt save rome and the empire from the deadly crime and the devastating vengeance of the outraged gods he towered above her like some inspired prophet with arms stretched out towards the fast approaching storm and eyes uplifted to the thunderbolts of jove 
i await thine answer he said o daughter of the caesars my answer has been given gracious lord she murmured have i not said that my life was at thy service thou'lt obey command o caesar to-morrow at the circus dost understand i have a plan and thou must obey blindly dost understand he reiterated hoarsely i understand my lord i'll name thy future husband to the public to the plebes to all and thou'lt accept him before them all without demur as my lord commands this thou dost swear this do i swear then said the mountebank with mock reverence as he placed his hand blood-stained with the blood of countless innocent victims of his tyranny upon the bowed head of the loyal girl received the blessings of jupiter the victorious of juno the holy goddess and of magna mater the great mother for thou art worthy to be of the house of caesar but even as the last of these impious words had left his lips the long-awaited storm broke out in sudden fury a vivid flash of lightning rent the sky from end to end and lit up momentarily every corner of the room the kneeling figure of dea flavia the misshapen figure of the imperial monster the fading flowers in the vases then a mighty clap of thunder shook the very foundation of dea flavia's palace caligula uttered a wild shriek of terror and calling loudly for his slaves he fled incontinently from the room end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of unto caesar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada unto caesar by baroness orksey chapter fifteen as he that bindeth a stone in a sling so is he that giveth honour to a fool proverbs twenty six verse eight from the hour of midnight the streets and ways leading to the great amphitheatre were alive with people all tending towards the same goal men and women in holiday clothes and little children running beside them the men were heavily loaded with baskets of rush or bags of rough linen containing provisions for many hours would be spent up there waiting for amusement whilst the body would grow faint if food were not forthcoming so the men carried the provisions which the women had prepared the day before eggs and cooked fish and such fruit as was cheap this season and everybody was running for though the amphitheatre was vast and could hold so twas said over two hundred thousand people yet considerably more than two hundred thousand people desired to be present at the opening of the games they were to last thirty-one days and spectacles would be varied and exciting but the great day would be the opening day the one on which everybody desired to be inside the amphitheatre if possible and not outside therefore an early start had to be made but this nobody minded as was is the want of a little sleep compared with the likelihood of missing the finest sight that had been witnessed in the city for years the caesar of course would be present he would solemnly declare the games to be open there were free gifts from him to the people a thank offering to the gods for his safe return from that arduous expedition in germany and he would show himself to his people 
receive their acclamations and give them as much show and gaiety music and combat as they cared to see so they went in their thousands and their tens of thousands starting in the middle of the night so as to be there when the great gates were opened and they would be allowed to pour into the vast enclosure and find as good seats for themselves and their families as they could and when at dawn the great copper gates did slowly swing open creaking upon their massive hinges it was as if the floodgates of the mighty sea had been suddenly let loose in they poured thousands upon thousands of them scrambling pushing and jumping scurrying and hurrying falling and tumbling as they pressed onwards through the wide doors and then dispersed in the vastness of the gigantic arena like ants that scamper away to their heaps so like so many pygmies they looked now fussy and excited perspiring profusely despite the cool breeze of this early dawn give them half an hour and they'll all settle down sitting row upon row tier upon tier of panting expectant humanity after much bousculating the strong ones have got to the front rows the weaker ones up aloft in the rear but all can see well into the arena and there are those who think that you get a better view if you sit more aloft certain it is that you get purer air and something of a shadow of the encircling walls there is no sign of cloud or storm to-day jove's thunder spent themselves during the morning hours of yesterday when clap upon clap awe-inspiring and deafening made every superstitious heart quake with terror at this possible augury of some coming disaster to-day the sky is clear and soon after dawn of that iridescent chrysaltine blue that lures the eye into the myriads and myriads of atoms the creation of the heat-laden ether that stretches away far away to the infinite distance beyond the beauty of the late summer's day was accepted as a matter of course as part and parcel of the holidays and festivals ordered by the caesar these too were the people's just dues emperors had to justify their existence by entertaining their people grumbling at their luxury and extravagances were only withheld because of other luxuries and extravagances perpetrated for the amusement of the people and from an early dawn there was plenty to see even though you did not watch the citron-coloured sky overhead as it slowly changed its diaphanous draperies for others that were rose then crimson and then gold finally casting off these two and showing its blue magnificence unadorned there were the soldiers on guard at the doors their yellow helmets shining in the sun their naked legs bronzed below their tunics they were the late comers to watch those who did not care for a midnight vigil and were arriving late like lazy ants creeping to their heaps finding all places occupied running hither and thither in search of an empty place then on the north side there were the tribunals of the senators the patricians and the knights with in the centre gorgeous with purple draperies and standards that which the caesar would occupy rich stuffs covered with gold embroideries fell over the edge of these tribunes and fluttered lazily in the morning breeze chairs and cushions were disposed there and it was interesting to make vague guesses as to who would occupy them the emperor's tribune was decorated with flowers huge bunches of lilies in pots of earthenware and crimson roses trailed in festoons overhead there was no doubt that augusta dea flavia would be present then lilies were her favourite flowers they were always to be seen wherever she appeared 
the tribunes of the rich were so disposed that the sun would never shed an unpleasant glare into them and over that part of the amphitheatre an awning of white and purple striped stuff threw a pleasant and restful shadow soon after the second hour the spectacle began processions of men and beasts who would take part in the combats and the shows the numidian lions in heavy iron cages drawn by eight pack horses were snarling as they were dragged along lean and hungry looking with bloodshot eyes that threatened and dribbling jaws waiting to devour the pack of hyenas from the desert a novelty not yet witnessed at the games the crocodiles from the nile and the wolves from the thracian forests it was amusing to hear the snarl of the lions and to think of them as they would appear anon pitted one against the other or engaged in deadly combat against the crocodiles but still more exciting would it be when the prisoners of war lately captured in germany would have to try their heavy fists against the masters of the desert the procession of the beasts had lasted close upon an hour the public waxed impatient beasts were well enough but their prey was what the people desired to see women clamoured as loudly as the men children stood up upon the benches to catch sight of the prisoners the malefactors the rebellious slaves who would furnish the sport later on presently they began to arrive and were greeted with loud acclamations trembling miserable bundles of humanity with hideous death staring at them all round the pungent odour of the wild beasts stinking of death the glowering eyes of an excited populace testifying that no mercy would be shown the slaves mostly looked the prey of abject terror backboneless and with the cold sweat already pouring from their huddled-up bodies they were men caught in the act of murder or of theft confirmed malefactors most of them now condemned to the arena to expiate their crimes and afford a holiday for the people some of the most hardened criminals had been dressed up to look like the german rebels whom the emperor was supposed lately to have vanquished with tog coloured wigs and coverings of goatskin round their torso they were marched round the gigantic arena with clanging chains on their wrists and ankles the public was delighted at their appearance it confirmed the prowess of the caesar for the men had been selected for this special exhibition because of their height or the breadth of their shoulders every one was curious to see them and howls of excreation greeted them as they passed it was felt that they deserved far more severe punishment than was meted to ordinary criminals they had rebelled against the might of caesar and in a manner had made attempt against his sacred life but the most interesting part of this early morning show was undoubtedly the black panther whom the native prince of numidia had sent as a tribute to the imperator wild rumours as to its cunning and its ferocity had been in circulation for some time but no one had ever seen it it had been kept closely guarded and heavily chained in the gardens of the caesar's palace and since its arrival from the desert was said to have grown to fabulous size and strength its inclusion in the spectacle of to-day had come as a exciting surprise for it was known that the caesar thought a great deal of the beast going out daily to watch it through its iron bars and delighting in the ferocity and cruel rapaciousness he had caused a special house to be built for it in the secluded portion of his garden with swimming bath carved out of solid block of african marble its feeding trough was made of gold and capons and penhens were especially fattened for its delectation 
many were the tales current about the caesar's fondness for the creature and his pleasure in seeing it fed with live animals which he would himself throw into the cage it was even said that he had fed the brute with human flesh the flesh of slaves who had disobeyed or merely offended him one of his chief amusements being to force one of these unfortunate wretches to thrust an arm into the cage and then to watch the panther as it scrunched the human bones and licked the human blood whilst cries of unspeakable horror and agony rent the air with their hideous sounds and now in order to delight his people the greatest and best of caesars would grant them the spectacle of his most precious pet loud clapping of hands and thunderous shouts of applause greeted the entrance of the magnificent cage which was drawn out into the arena by sixteen negro slaves the bars of the cage were gilded and it was surmounted by the imperial standard and the insignia of imperial rank its pedestal was of carved wood and mounted on massive wheels of steel in the front were four heavy chains of steel and to these the sixteen negroes were harnessed they were naked save for the lion cloth of scarlet cloth and on their heads were fillets of shining metal each adorned with five long ostrich feathers which had been dipped in brilliant scarlet dye the weight of the cage with its solid pedestal and heavy iron bars must have been terrific for the sixteen powerful africans strained on the chains as they walked burying their feet in the sand of the arena their backs bent the muscles of their shoulders and arms standing out like living cords in the corner of the cage cowered the powerful creature its broad snake-like head thrust forward its tiny golden eyes fixed before it a curious snarl like a grin now and then contorted the immobility of its powerful jaws the sinewy tail beat a restless tattoo on the floor of the cage now and then when a jerk on the uneven ground disturbed it from its ominous quietude the brute would jump up suddenly quick as a lightning flash and bound right across the cage striking out with his huge black paw to where one of the rearmost negroes back appeared temptingly near the cunning precision with which the paw hit out exactly between two iron bars highly pleased the public and once when the mighty claws did reach a back and tore it open from the shoulder to the waist a wild shout of delight echoed and re-echoed by thousands upon thousands of throats shook the very walls of the gigantic amphitheatre children screamed with pleasure the women applauded rapturously the men shouted habit habit he has it the unfortunate slave who giddy with the loss of blood rolled inanimate between the wheels of the cage it was at this moment when the excited populace went nearly wild with delight that a loud fanfare of brass trumpets announced the approach of the caesar he entered his tribune preceded by an escort of his praetorian guard with flying standards at sight of him the huge audience rose to its feet like one man and cheered him to the echoes cheered him with just the same shouts as those with which a few moments ago it had claimed the ferocious prowess of the panther cheered him with the same shouts with which it would have hailed his death his assassination the proclamation of his successor he was clad in a tunic of purple silk wrought with the sun moon and stars in threads of gold and silver and on his chest was the breastplate of augustus which he had dug up out of the vault where the great emperor lay buried on his head was a diadem 
of jewels in shape like the rays of the sun standing out all around his misshapen head and in his hands he carried a gold thunderbolt emblem of jove and a trident emblem of neptune he was surrounded by his own guard by a company of knights and a group of senators and patricians and immediately behind him walked his wife cassonia and his uncle claudius the brother of germanicus he came to the front of the tribune allowing the populace a full view of his grotesque person and listening with obvious satisfaction to the applause and the cheers that still rose in ceaseless echoes upwards to the sky he did not hear the ironical laughter nor yet the mocking comments on his appearance which was more than of a caricature than of a sentient man he was satisfied that all eyes were turned on himself and on the majestic pomp which surrounded him the standard-bearers were ordered to wave the flags so that a cloud of purple and gold seemed to be wafted all around his head and he ordered the augustas to group themselves around him the people watched this pageant as they had done the earlier spectacles it was all a part of the show stage managed for their amusement they were interested to see the augustus and those who knew mentioned the various names to their less fortunate neighbors cassonia standed next to her lord she gave him a love potion once so tis said because his passion for her was quickly on the wane and tis that love potion which had made him crazy and there are the caesar's sisters drusilla and livilla drusilla is very beautiful and there is julia the daughter of drusus she had been willing to step into cassonia's shoes but dea flavia daughter of claudius octavius is the most beautiful amongst them all hail to delia flavia augusta came from more than one enthusiastic throat she was clad all in white with strings of pearls round her neck and a fillet of diamonds in her golden hair her face was very pale and her lips never smiled in her hands she held three tall sprays of lilies scarce whiter than the smooth surface of her brow every one noticed that the caesar especially commanded her to sit on his left caesonia being on his right and that the augustas all frowned with dissatisfaction at this signalled honour paid to dea flavia and on caius napos the praetorian praefect came to the front of the tribune and in centurion voice commanded every one to kneel all those in the tribune did kneel immediately the guard holding the standards the senators and the knights the augustas all knelt too and the patricians in the tribunes to right and left some of the people knelt but not by any means all and caius nepos had to repeat his command three or four times and to threaten the immediate dispersal of the audience and the clearing of the amphitheatre before every one at last obeyed caligula alone remained standing and not far from him the praefect of rome leaning against the partition wall the caesar then blessed the people and at the word of cassius napos the praetorian praefect cries of hail caesar hail o god hail the father of the armies the greatest and the best of caesar broke out on every side End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of unto caesar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada 
unto caesar by baroness orksey chapter sixteen who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth ecclesiastics three verse twenty one cassius julius caesar caligula was in excellent spirits smiling and nodding to those around him and to his people all the time his face certainly looked sallow and his eyes were bloodshot but this may have been due to ill health for without doubt his temper was of the best only once had he frowned when looking behind him he saw that the praefect of rome had remained standing when every one knelt to acclaim the caesar but even then the frown was quickly dissipated and he spoke quite pleasantly to the praefect later on the augustas grouped around him were continually laughing as he turned to them from time to time with a witty sally or probably with what was more in keeping with his character a coarse jest and he watched the spectacle attentively from end to end firstly the play in verse on the subject of the judgment of paris a perversion of the legend favored by the greeks a travesty within paris renamed parisia was a woman and three gods were in rivalry for the golden apple the emblem of her favors then the naval spectacle over the flooded area with ships and galleys executing complex manoeuvres on waters rendered turbulent by cleverly contrived artificial means then the wrestling and the scenes of hunting with wolves and boars specially brought from the thracian forests for the occasion he watched the numidian lions tearing one another to pieces he exulted with the audience over the fight between a pack of hyenas and some crocodiles from the nile he encouraged the gladiators in their fights and joined in the excitement that grew and grew with every item of the a program which had been skilfully arranged so that it began with simple and peaceful shows and gradually became more bloodthirsty and more fierce it seemed as if a cunning mind alert to the temper of the people had contrived the entertainment so that with every stage of the proceedings something of the lustful love of cruelty inherent in every roman citizen would be gradually aroused the hunting scenes were a prelude to the combat between the lines and these again were the forerunners of the more bloody bouts between the hyenas and the crocodiles at last blood had begun to flow the audience sniffed at its sickening odour with a thrill of nostril and brain and tongues and lips became parched with the fever of desire for more the other items the play the naval pageant the scenes of hunting and combat of beasts among themselves these were only the prologue the real spectacle was at last to commence for this the romans thirsted patricians and plebes alike rich and poor man woman and child these shows were their very life they constituted the essence of their entire being for these they rose at midnight and stood waiting hour upon hour that they might be near enough to smell the blood when it reddened the sand of the arena and to see the last throw of agony on the face of those who fell in combat habit 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 the cry became more insistent and more hoarse see the men and women leaning over the edge of the tribunes their eyes wide open their hands outstretched with thumb pointing relentlessly the way of death habit habit shrieked the women when a prostrate figure lay writhing on the ground and the victor with head erect demanded the final verdict 
and up in the imperial tribune the caesar jested and laughed the standards waved above his head the striped awnings threw a cold blue shadow over his gorgeous robes and the jewel-crowned heads of the augustas the rest of the gigantic arena was a blaze of riotous colour now with the mid-morning sun darting its rays almost perpendicularly on the south side of the huge oval place a sea of heads gold and brown ruddy and black oscillating in unison to the right or left like waters driven by the tide as the combatants down below shifted their ground across the floor of the arena fans of colored feathers swinging mantles caught by the passing breeze every grain of sand on the floor of the arena a minute mirror radiating the light everything glowed with an intensity of color rendered all by the more vivid by contrast with the dense shadows thrown against the marble walls on the south side every shade of russet and brown and green showed in the mantles and the tunics of the plebes and seemed flecked with the vivid gold under the light of the sun whilst in the tribunes of the rich on the opposite side cool tones of amethyst and cries of glaze were veiled in tender azure by the shadow from the awning above and at either end to east and west the massive copper portals like gigantic ruddy mirrors threw back these tones of gold and blue as if through a veil of sunset kissed clouds above the sky of a vivid blue translucent and iridescent with myriad flecks of turquoise and rose and emerald that found their reflections in the marble walls of the arena or the shining helmets of the legionaries guarding the imperial tribune and over the whole scene an impalpable veil of gold made of tiny unseen atoms that danced in the heat and merged into the exquisite glowing harmony the russets and the purples the emeralds and the rubies and the transient notes of sardonyx and indigo that cut across the orgy of colour like a deep gaping wound and through it all that sense of thrilling expectancy so keen that it almost seemed palpable it vibrated in the air making every cheek glow with a crimson fire and kindling a light in every eye it seemed to set every golden atom dancing it was felt through every breath drawn by two hundred thousand throats over the emperor's head that striped awning flapped weirdly in the breeze with strange insistent sounds like the knocking of a ghostly hand upon the doors of hell not a few miserable wretches whom the summary justice of the caesar's own tribunal had condemned to death were exposed to a band of swordsmen executioners really since the fight was quite unequal huge african giants with short naked swords pursuing a few emaciated wretches who ran howling round the arena jumping improvised hurdles rounding obstacles or crawling under cover running running with that unreasoning instinct of self-preservation which drives even before the certainty of death a hunting scene this of novel diversion no one cared whether the victims were really guilty of crime no one cared if they had been equitably tried and been justly condemned all that the public cared about was that the spectacle was new and amusing the african giants were well trained for their part playing with the miserable victims like a failing doth with its prey allowing them to escape now and then to see safety close at hand to make a wild dash for what looked like freedom and then suddenly pounding on them with that short wide sword that cried death as it descended 
rapturous applause greeted this show and loud immoderate laughter hailed the fruitless efforts of the hunted their falls over the obstacles their look of horror and the contortions of their meagre bodies when they were caught at last habit 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 every one shouted and when one of the unfortunate wretches brought to bay tried to turn on his pursuer and to pit two feeble arms against the relentless grip of well-trained giants and against the death-dealing sword habit 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 he has it they screamed he has the hideous death the gaping wound in the still panting chest he has the final agony which helps to make a holiday for the great citizens of the world now at last the sand of the arena has turned red with blood the sickly odor mounts to every nostril shrieks become more wild like those of thousands of demons to let loose anticipation and desire had been brought to its wildest pitch and caligula had every cause to be satisfied cries of the lions the lions slaves to the lions resounded from every side thousands of feet beat a tattoo on the floor and from behind the great copper gates a mighty roar filled the heat-laden air with its awesome echo in his gilded cage supported by carved pillars and drawn by eight ethiopian slaves the favorite of caligula was slowly wheeled into the arena a huge sigh rose from every breast the tumult was hushed dead silence fell upon the vast concourse of people suddenly turned to stone alive only by two hundred thousand pairs of eyes fixed upon the cage and its occupant the black panther with its sleek black coat on which the midday sun threw its tiny blotches of tawny lights was cowering in the corner of its cage its snake-like head with the broad flat brow and wide curved jaws was drawn back between its shoulders its small golden eyes gleaming like yellow topaz were half closed in wary somnolence slowly the cage was wheeled round by the panting negro slaves and then it was brought to a standstill against the copper gates at the eastern end of the arena end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of unto caesar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules horlock of mississauga ontario canada unto caesar by baroness orksey chapter seventeen be thou faithful unto death revelations two verse ten up in the gorgeously draped tribune beneath the striped awning the emperor caligula watched the arrival of his pet panther with a grin of delight upon his face he rubbed his hands together in obvious glee and anon pointed out the beauty of the ferocious creature to the augusta dea flavia who coldly nodded in response she had sat beside the caesar all through the long weary morning giving but few signs of life many there were who thought that overcome with drowsiness owing to the heat she had fallen asleep with her head buried in the fragrant depths of the lilies which she held certain it is that throughout the spectacle she had kept her eyes closed and when death cries filled the air with their terrible echo she had once or twice put her small hands to her ears whenever she had done that the caesar had laughed and apparently made jest of her with the other augustas who in their turn appeared greatly amused 
the spectacle indeed had been somewhat tame and but for the human chase of a while ago would have been intolerably dull there was surely nothing in the death of a few miserable slaves to upset the nerves of a roman princess as for the gladiators well they were trained and well paid to die not far from the caesar's person and leaning against the wall of the tribune in his wonted attitude the praefect of rome had also stood silently by the emperor had ordered his presence nor could the praefect of the city be absent when the sacred person of the caesar was abroad amongst his people but no one could say whether the anglicanus had seen or heard anything of what went on around him his eyes of a truth were wide open but they did not gaze down upon the arena they were hidden by that dark frown upon his brow and no one could guess whereon was his ardent gaze so resolutely fixed no one could guess that from where he stood taurus antinor could perceive the outline of a delicate profile with the softly rounded cheek and a tiny shell-like ear half hidden by the flimsy veil of curls he could see that the lids with their fringe of golden lashes fall wearily over the eyes he could trace the shudder of horror which shook the slender figure from time to time once the lilies dropped from dea flavia's hand and the soft swishing sound which they made in falling caused her to wake as from a reverie she looked all round her with wide-open eyes and her glance suddenly encountered those of the praefect of rome it seemed to him that her very soul was in her eyes then a soul which at that moment appeared full of horror at all that she had seen but as quickly as she had thus involuntarily revealed her soul so did she conceal it again beneath her favoured veil of unbendable pride she frowned on him as if angered that he should have surprised the secret and almost it seemed then that she flashed on him a look of hatred and contempt after that she turned away and with her foot kicked away the fallen lilies she sat now leaning forward motionless and still with her elbows buried in the embroidered cushion before her and her chin resting on her hands oh if only he could how gladly would he have seized her even now and carried her away from this nauseating scene of bloodshed and cruelty he crossed his arms over his powerful chest till every muscle seemed to crack with the effort of self-control his very soul longed to take her away his sinews ached with the desire to seize her and to bear her in his arms away away beyond the cruel encircling walls of rome away from her marble palaces and temple-crowned hills away over the marshes of the campania and the belt of the blue sea beyond to that far-off land of galilee where he himself had found happiness and peace the caesar had commanded his presence here to-day and he had come because the caesar had commanded to the last he would render unto caesar that which was caesar's but he had stood by with eyes that only saw a golden head crowned with diamonds a delicate oval cheek coloured like a peach and tiny fleecy curls that fluttered softly in the breeze there was no longer any sorrow in his heart no longer any remorse or thought of treachery the man in the little hut on the aventine had shown him the way how to lay down his burden of weakness and of sin he knew that he loved dea flavia with all the ardour of an untamed heart that was never before tasted the sweetness of love he knew that he loved her with all the passion of a soul that at last had found a mate but now he knew also that in this love there was no thought of treachery to him in whose service he was prepared to lay down his life he knew that never again 
would the exquisite vision of this fair young pagan stand between him and the cross but rather that she would point to him ignorantly and unconsciously the way up to golgotha for renunciation awaited him that also did he know a few more days in the service of the caesar and his promise to remain in rome would no longer bind him since caligula had returned from abroad the rest of his life was at the bidding of him who mutely from the cross had demanded his allegiance a lonely hut somewhere on the campania or further if god demanded it a life of strenuous effort to win souls for christ and the renunciation of all that had made life easy and pleasant hitherto god alone knew how easy that would have been to him forty-eight hours ago taurus antinor hated and despised the life of rome the tyranny of a demented caesar the indolence of the daily routine the ever recurrent spectacles of hideous inhumane cruelty until that midday hour in the forum four days ago he had viewed his new prospective life with a sense of infinite relief but now renunciation meant something more detachment from rome and all its pomps its glories and its cruelties meant also detachment from the presence of dea flavia it meant the tearing out of his very heart-strings which had found root at a woman's feet it meant the drawing of an impenetrable veil between life itself and all that henceforth could alone make life dear he had dreamed a dream the exquisite beauty of which had wrought la havoc in his innermost soul but the awakening had come before the glorious dream had found its complete birth jesus of nazareth had called to him from the cross but even as he called the pierced sacred hand had pointed to the broad path strewn with gold and roses filled with the fragrance of lilies and thrilled with the song of mating birds and the dying voice had gently murmured choose the soldier had chosen and was ready to go but renunciation was not to be the easy turning away from a road that was none too dear it was to be a sacrifice the taking up of the cross and the slow weary mounting up up to cavalry with aching back and sweating brow and the dreary tragedy of the utter loneliness it meant the giving up of every delight of manhood of happiness in a woman's smile of rapture in a woman's kiss it meant the giving up of every joy in seeing her pass before him of hearing the swish of her skirts on the pavement of the city it meant the giving up of all hope ever to win her of all thought of a future home the patter of children's feet the rocking of a tiny cradle it meant the sacrifice of every thought of happiness and of every desire of body and of soul it meant the nailing of a heart to the foot of a cross End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of unto caesar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada unto caesar by baroness orksey chapter eighteen so i gave them up unto their own heart's lust and they walked in their own counsels psalm thirty one verse twelve in the meantime the stage hands the smiths and the carpenters had been busily at work setting the scene for the coming drama huge gnarled tree trunks were dragged into the arena and so disposed as to afford shelter either for man or beast 
by a mechanical device a stream of water some six foot wide was made to wind its course along the sands and groups of tall reeds and other aquatic plants were skilfully arranged beside the banks of this improvised stream soon the whole aspect of the arena was thus transformed into an open piece of country with trees here and there and tufts of grass mounds and monticules with a stream and a reed-covered shore the whole beautifully arranged and with due regard for realism the people watched highly pleased now that the emperor's pet panther had appeared they were satisfied that a spectacle such as they loved was about to be unfolded before them but soon the workmen were engaged on other work the purport of which could not at first be guessed to understand it all a vivid picture of the huge arena must appear before the mind down below there was an artificial landscape the trees the stream the sand and grass and all around the massive marble walls rose to a height of some twelve feet to the lowest tier of the tribunes beyond which sat row upon row in precipitous gradients two hundred thousand spectators at about four feet from the ground a narrow ledge formed by the elaborate carving in the solid marble ran right along the walls and between this ledge and the top of the wall there was a low colonnaded arcade with deep niches set between the fluted columns from these niches the workmen now suspended short ladders of twisted crimson silk of sufficient strength to bear the weight of a man they affixed these to heavy steel rings embedded in the bases of the columns and when the ladders were in position they hung down low enough that a man standing on the ledge below could just contrive to seize the ends and to swing himself aloft up into the niche the public watched these preparations with breathless interest for soon their objects became evident it was clear that those who were to be exposed to an encounter with the panther would be given a fair chance of escape it was to be an even fight between man and beast a man hotly pursued by the brute could if he were sufficiently agile leap upon the narrow ledge seize the rope ladder and climb it up until he reached the safe haven of the niche and could draw the ladder in after him and fear of death doth lend the man wondrous agility it looked in fact as if the coming struggle were all to be in favour of the man and not of the beast for the smooth surface of the wall and the narrow ledge above the carvings could not afford foothold to an enraged four-foot creature with sharp claws that would glance off the polished marble the public realizing this waxed impatient the novel spectacle did not after all promise to be to its liking the panther would make but a sorry show if it was not given a helpless victim or two to devour murmurs of dissatisfaction rose from every side as the work proceeded and anon when all round the walls of the arena the twelve ladders of safety were firmly fixed seeming mutely to deride the excitement of the people the murmur broke into angry cries but caligula did not seem to heed either the murmur or those loud expressions of discontent which at other times would probably have maddened him with rage he had watched the preparations with eager interest and had himself once or twice shouted directions to the workmen now when everything appeared complete he turned to the tribune which was next to his own and his small bloodshot eyes wandered over the assembly of patricians of knights and of senators who were seated there he called my lord hortensius martius to him and appeared to be pointing out to him the advantages of the rope ladders with obvious pride in the ingenuity of the device 
young escanis too was bidden to admire the contrivance which it soon became evident was the invention of the caesar himself the public still feeling dissatisfied watched desultorily for a while the doings in the imperial tribune the general interest was once more aroused when the workmen slaves and legionaries having finished their preparations hurried helter-skelter out of the arena the sliding doors of the panther's cage were being slowly drawn away for a few seconds the powerful brute remained wary silent and cowering then with one mighty savage snarl it bounded into the arena supple graceful and splendid it walked round in the solemn majesty its flat head kept low to the ground its sinuous body curving and winding as it walked like that of a snake the public watched it fascinated by the perfect grace of its movements and by the cruel ferocity of its tiny eyes now at the eastern end of the amphitheatre a small iron gate slowly swung upon its hinges and in the dark recesses beyond it a couple of men appeared for a moment they stood there immovable a closely huddled mass shoulder to shoulder with round open eyes dilated with fear and a cry of nameless terror still hovering unuttered on their lips they were hugely built men with massive torsos and legs bare and tow-colored hair brought straight up to the crown of the head and knotted there with a black band there was much shouting from the recess whence they had emerged and anon some vigorous prodding and pushing from behind but they dug their bare feet into the sand refusing to move arm against arm they made of themselves a wall which fear of death kept rigor and horror made unbreakable the public greeted them with mock applause in them they had quickly recognized the german barbarians whom the caesar had brought back from his last expedition as prisoners of war in truth they were hardened malefactors who had been offered a chance of life in exchange for the pitiful masquerade but this the public did not know to the two hundred thousand holiday-makers craning their necks to see the miserable wretches they were but the living proofs of this caesar's prowess in the field with ironical cheers they were bidden to advance even whilst at no great distance from them the black panther sitting on its haunches was surveying them with lazy curiosity licking its mighty jaws then the public grew impatient and from the recesses behind the two men persuasion became more vigorous through the darkness behind the gates there appeared the red glow of a brazier there was a quick hissing sound an awful double howl of pain and the smell of burnt flesh filled the air the next moment the two men fell scrambling forward into the arena and the iron gate closed behind them with a thud end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of unto caesar by baroness Auxy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea. Chapter 19 Thou art become guilty in the blood that thou hast shed. Ezekiel 22, 4 The hunter and the hunted, the lithe, supple, sinewy creature, crawling with belly almost touching the ground, and stealthy steps that made no sound on the sand of the arena wary and silent the black beast crawled now hiding amidst the scrubby grass now bounding over trees and stream as if playing with herself with her own desire for a taste of human blood at first terror had kept the two men rooted to the spot paralyzed and with feet deeply embedded in the sand only their eyes seemed alive roaming along the wall all round to where on either side the silken ladders made vivid crimson streaks on the white smoothness of the marble the panther waiting watching them till they moved the public entranced 
scarcely dared to draw breath. Then came a sudden cry from thousands of throats. The two men, as if driven by a sudden sense of approaching death, had made a quick desperate rush, one to the right, the other to the left, towards the crimson silk which meant safety to them. But the panther was on guard and quicker twice than they. It seemed as if the brute had divined exactly where lay escape for its prey. It was guarding both sides of the arena at once, bounding from left to right and back from right to left with giant leaps, soundless and swift. The men paused again, because it seemed that when they were still, the panther too lay still and watched. There was another lull, and from the imperial tribune above, Dea Flavia watched the horrible spectacle, and Taurus Antinor drank into his soul the beauty of her eyes as they watched, fascinated every movement of the sleek black panther and of those fair-skinned giants trying to escape from death. She watched the stealthy approach of the beast towards its prey. She watched, motionless and still, the while great beads of perspiration matted the fair curls on her brow. And to the man who loved her, who saw her thus watching the horrible spectacle which must have made her feel sick and faint. To him it seemed as if in her mind the hideous sight meant something more than just the brutal display of cruelty, which was a familiar one enough in Rome. It seemed as if to her some hidden meaning lay in this teasing of a ferocious brute, and in this apparent clemency in allowing the victim's chance of escape, for every now and then she turned as if involuntarily towards the Caesar, and a quick glance of understanding seemed to pass between her and that inhuman monster. Taurus Antinor, with his gaze fixed upon her every movement, wondered what all that could mean. After a quarter of an hour of tense excitement, of alternate cries of horror and screams of delight, the two men had, by dint of cunning and agility, succeeded in evading the panther. They were safe within the protecting niches. The panther down below was roaring with baffled rage, and the public clapped and cheered vociferously. Two more men were thrust into the arena, dressed in the same way as the others, pushed forward like the others to the accompaniment of the brazier's glow and the smell of burnt flesh. The panther, more wary this time, did not allow both men to escape, yet they had made a clever dash for safety. One of them was already swinging himself aloft, but the other had missed his footing once. When he jumped upon the ledge, he regained it and seized the swinging end of the ladder, but the panther, with a bound, had reached him and caught his foot in its jaws. That hideous noise, the scrunching of a human bone, was drowned in a tumultuous applause as the miserable wretch with the maimed and bleeding leg, but with that almighty instinct for life at any cost, toiled, mangled and bleeding up that ladder, less crimson than the trail which he left in his wake. Dear Flavia's head fell forward on the cushion, but she fought against the swoon. The ironical laughter of the Augustuses around her quickly brought her to herself. "'The heat is overpowering,' she said calmly in reply to a coarse comment from the Caesar. End of chapter 19